raising the IQ and bankrolls of sports bettors everywhere. The Better IQ Podcast is your source for sports betting information, analysis, and opinions. Learn. Bet. Win. Better IQ. Good afternoon and welcome to the Better IQ podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Lang. NFL regular season officially underway. Uh, we witnessed, I don't know what we witnessed uh, last night. We'll get our guest's opinion on it. But uh, week one uh, card, uh, full slate, of course, on Sunday. Got a doubleheader on Monday and we're going to bring in two guests. Lead off with Aaron Rennie and close out with Eric Waz. And of course, break down every game uh, from a betting perspective. So uh, we'll jump right into it. Uh, welcome in. ER, how are you this afternoon? Well, I'm doing good. As you mentioned, the NFL season, I guess you could say, kicked off last night. Uh, I had a small bet on the under, so I was certainly happy to see a 10-3 to uh, final. The hype machine that is Chicago Bears uh, got a long way to go. And, um, you know, certainly the first game of the season, uh, you can't go crazy one way or the other. But certainly the pressure mounts on that Chicago Bears coaching staff and um, the quarterback position in Mitchell Trubisky, uh, we talked about it. The Bears, really tough schedule. Um, Going to have a harder time now getting to 10 wins. But uh, we look forward to uh, this weekend's card, college football. And if, I, th- I tell you what, Andrew, this is, from a time standpoint, uh, this is about as good as you can get in the NFL here. Um, you know, I always thought they should maybe add an extra week and put an extra bye week in and give these those Thursday games a uh, essentially you're coming off 10 days off for a bye uh, for those Thursday games, uh, which you kind of had. Obviously, both teams were rested for this Thursday, but you have seven early games on Sunday, five late games that you generally always screw that up. Uh, and then you have the two Monday night games. I wish we had this schedule. Uh, each and every week, and uh, hopefully going to have uh, plenty of winners on this uh, on the schedule as well, Andrew. And let's get to uh, the games. And one at the top of the card that I, I thought I thought pretty interesting. You know, we've seen number one. We go back to the summer when these games opened up, and you saw kind of that initial move. And then, of course, you see a lot of reaction, some warned and some not, to what took place in the uh, in the preseason. But this was a game. If you go in and you look at the line history. Um, just not a not a whole lot of a movement. Some up, some down. Just small, a half point here, a half point there, and that, of course, I'm talking about Atlanta and uh, Minnesota. So Minnesota, way back in the summer, opened four and a half. The total opened forty seven and a half, and here we're seeing we're seeing four. And it was 47 and a half on the total until this morning. It got played under a little. It's now 47. So uh, according to the markets, odds makers may have gotten this one uh, right here, Aaron. Uh, leading off the uh, week, top of the car, what are your thoughts and opinions, Vikings and Falcons? Well, I tell you what, two teams with Super Bowl aspirations, but I'll say this, the heat is on uh, both these organizations and probably the head coaches more than anything. Minnesota, of course, 8-7-1. Straight up last year, uh, they had much higher uh, expectations. And meanwhile, Atlanta, essentially the season was lost uh, in that first couple of weeks as they were super banged up on defense. But uh, it was a disaster for Atlanta, 7-9 and nine, uh, straight up, 5-11 and 11 against the spread. Uh, that defense still... Um, you know, let them down. And again, you know, some of that was an injury standpoint. And, you know, we'll talk about that right away here uh, with the Falcons. They were essentially from a DVOA standpoint, 31st ranked defensive team uh, last year. Dan Quinn, in fact, fires uh, the defensive coordinator and he's going to take over the defense. Uh, you're going to, you know, we, we see in the NFL, basically for the most part, you see a lot of these head coaches calling the offensive plays. They're offensive coordinators at heart. Uh, Dan Quinn, of course, uh, with the Seattle Seahawks uh, Super Bowl teams, he's a defensive coordinator uh, at the pulse of everything. So, um, you know, this defense just hasn't been good. Ranked 31st, 22nd, 26th, and 22nd uh, the last four years. So he's going to come in, and um, it's, it's not a bad time to come in because remember just how banged up uh, this defense was last year. Uh, Deion Jones, uh, their star linebacker, missed considerable amount of time. Ricardo Allen uh, and Neil, the safeties, uh, missed uh, a ton of time here as well. So uh, there's still talent here, 
this is an athletic uh, team, and there's talent really all over this Atlanta roster. So uh, you would expect, if anything, um, out of this unit, uh, the defense should be much improved. Uh, we know the offense is certainly capable, although uh, this game is is circled right now, Andrew. Julio Jones uh, looking for another contract. Uh, potentially, uh, he could hold out and miss this first game uh, for Minnesota. Uh, also, uh, Stefan Diggs, uh, his still listed as questionable with a hamstring, uh, in this game, Minnesota, interesting to see how this team is going to perform because Mike Zimmer, uh, essentially, uh, remember they fired their offensive coordinator about week 10, uh, last year. Uh, they've kind of revamped this offense, new offensive coordinator, Kevin Stefanski. They bring in Gary Kubiak. Uh, they bring in um, the O line, a new uh, old offensive line coach, and Rick Dennison. This team is made no bones about it uh, that they want to be a power uh, running football team. Play a couple of tight ends, play a couple of running backs, the play action. Uh, they want to win with conservative play and defense. And you know, I think Atlanta will, will have a little bit more to that to a degree as well. So uh, I think uh, the best way to look at this one is uh, under the total. Next game, divisional affair here, uh, Aaron Washington in uh, Philadelphia. Going back earlier this summer, Philly opened eight, pretty quickly went to nine and kind of held Pat at nine. And then all of a sudden, just over the course of the last, what, three or four days, Aaron, we've seen another uh, rush of uh, Eagles of money is offshore. Uh, now 10 across the uh, board. In fact, uh, 10 and a half or 10 with juice at a number of uh, places. Total's been played down 46 and a half, down to 44 and a half. What's your take here? Yeah, I certainly understand. Uh, you talked about how the last game has not moved much. This one certainly has. And even earlier this week, you know, you saw nine and a half on this game. It's clearly 10. Uh, it's been a one way freight train here uh, to the Eagles. Been a one way train uh, on this game under the total as well. And you can understand uh, if you break these two teams down. Obviously, Philadelphia a little bit disappointing last year at nine and seven uh, straight up, but they do eventually get into the playoffs. Uh, Carson Wentz, the quarterback, has changed his diet, uh, got the workout. He was kind of disappointed with what he did from a performance perspective, but he was still just a year off that knee injury. Uh, supposedly he is sharp, and this offense is loaded. It's got a great offensive line. They bring in Deshaun Watson, or I'm sorry, Deshaun Jackson, uh, in the offseason to give them a big play threat, uh, expecting big things. Uh, here from this offense, the defense has ob- obviously uh, been capable here as well under Jim Schwartz. He's a, he's been able to figure it out and and make it work with these guys. Uh, interesting, you know, from a DVOA standpoint, really just middle of the pack uh, last year uh, with uh, how this team was rated. But remember uh, how banged up the secondary was. I mean, they were essentially, and no lie. Uh, remember that game against the Dallas Cowboys. They're essentially signing guys off the street uh, to play uh, in that secondary. So they're hoping to get a lot of these guys back healthy. Should make all the difference in the world for this Eagles team. Um, can't say a lot of positive here for Washington. They've been a hot play under the se- uh, under the total season wins at six. You can still find that. Probably worth trying to uh, find and make a bet there. Case Keenum uh, going to be the starting quarterback. Uh, for this team and really just from a talent perspective uh, it's just hard you, you got to squint really hard uh, to uh, find you know to be on the same level here as the Philadelphia Eagles obviously left tackle Trent Williams really kind of the glue and the main guy um, uh, on this offense uh, he is holding out he's not happy with his team uh, and it's gotten so bad that they're expect to, to start Eric Flowers on that offensive line, who's just been a disaster. Uh, even reading some of the comments, uh, Eric Flowers has been a big time bust on anybody's offensive line in his NFL career. Uh, you know, kind of the scouting report was in in the preseason. Andrew, uh, a guy like Eric Flowers was getting beat by the second and third string uh, from these other teams. So, uh, not good. Uh, defense, it, you know, maybe some a few bright spots, but then you're talking about a 30-year-old Josh Norman. Uh, they were extremely healthy. Uh, I talked about the Eagles that were not, so uh, it looks like a long season. Uh, you know, Washington looks, uh, boy, it's just hard to find anything on that offense. Uh, I did uh, have a bet uh, under the total. 
Uh, but boy, that ship has kind of sailed, as you mentioned, a couple 45s out there still in Vegas. Aaron, I know later in the uh, season at times there are some, uh, you know, we'll call them profiles, trends, angles, or whatever that have to do with divisional games. Have you noticed anything historically when you have a divisional game to start the season? You know, I have not. Obviously, we saw a low-scoring game last night between the Packers uh, and Chicago Bears. I'll say this. I was almost a little bit surprised. I guess it's me uh, that there was many division games as there are here uh, in week one. Obviously, Thursday night we had one, uh, Monday night football. Yeah, there's, they're sprinkled around pretty good here. Uh, for this opening week. So, uh, yeah, I was a little surprised by that. Yeah, in fact, that's going to lead us into our next game, a divisional game with uh, Buffalo and the uh, the Jets. And this one kind of interesting because, uh, you know, when you look at the, the, the summer futures market, it seemed as if there were uh, kind of a, a pro stance there in the Jets and certainly an anti stance on the, uh, the Buffalo Bills. In fact, you go in and look at the odds to win the uh, division, you see the Jets, uh, you know, maybe four or five to one, whereas Buffalo – uh, seven or eight to one. I'm talking to win that uh, AFC uh, East uh, division. So, uh, but despite all that, we've seen a recent. Um, I don't know if you want to call it flood, Aaron, but a lot of those threes that were sitting there for the uh, Jets have been taken out. Is uh, the offshore world majority of shops sitting, sitting two and a half uh, with uh, a little bit of a juice uh, total played up to a uh, forty and a half. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm going to have a small bet here on the Buffalo Bills. The you know the Bills are. Certainly on the upward trend, I think they're building this uh, the right way uh, with Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott. Um, you know, one of the big things, they added 15 free agents this year. So um, they're, they're trying to be competitive uh, this year. They've upgraded that offensive line. They've upgraded the wide receiver position to a certain degree. Uh, obviously, all eyes will be on Josh Allen and see – uh, if he can improve his accuracy and take a, a, st- a pretty good step forward here uh, this year. But, you know, he has a few more weapons to work with, with John Brown and Cole Beasley. They, they brought in a center here as well. Remember this offensive line. Uh, talk about signing guys off the street. Uh, they kind of were last year uh, as well. And, uh, in fact, if you go back to opening day last year, uh, Andrew, they're expecting perhaps 11 new starters on this offense. You just don't see that kind of turnover that often in the NFL. It's happened with a few teams uh, this year. So, uh, you know, remember, if they can improve a bit here on offense, if they can go from 31st to 20th, they had the second-ranked defense last year. This defense uh, was that good, and, they, they, you know, they have room for improvement because, you know, stats like they're 31st in the red zone, et cetera, uh, so I, I think uh, this Buffalo Bills team can be a little bit under the radar. Perhaps we can make some money with them. To me, the Jets have to, I guess you could say, prove it to me. Um, you you have a new coach. You essentially have a new regime here. Adam uh, Gase, the new head coach, uh, interesting to see how he's going to fare. I like the new GM that they brought in, Joe Douglas, although uh, they didn't bring him into about May. But I think from an organizational standpoint, uh, they finally got the right guy in there. Um, you know, I'm still just not sold on the head coach here. I'm not sold on the defensive coordinator and Greg Williams. And I'm not sold on the quarterback, Sam Darnold. And I, I just don't remember uh, the hype uh, of a starting quarterback that we've had with a guy like Sam Darnold, who really hasn't accomplished anything uh, so far at the NFL level. 17 to 15 touchdown to interception ratio last year, 58% completion five fumbles, uh, you know, he was better towards the end of the year, but I, I just need to see something here on the field. And like you mentioned, it's kind of crazy because, you know, you hear so much about Sam Darnold, et cetera. And here, here we go with the Buffalo bills, taking the money. Uh, and, uh, some of that has been my money here, uh, on this early game on Sunday. Baltimore and uh, Miami. This one much talked about, of course. Uh, Miami. I mean, you know, the 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 recent talk. I mean, there were Aaron. Look, we we knew heading into the season. You go back all the way in the summer that this was going to be a quote unquote kind of rebuilding job. But there's been multiple situations, things that have occurred, trades, etc. Uh, you know, articles, media coverage where, and you just don't see this. 
uh, certainly to start a year uh, in the uh, the NFL, talk of year zero, talk of you know tank mode, complete rebuilding a job, but that's kind of being uh, you know tagged here uh, with everything that uh, you know associated with Miami uh, football. And the markets have responded to that as uh, Baltimore. It was paced. It was seven across the uh, board, and, and some betters came in and, and took all those sevens out. But now we're starting to see a, a couple more. In fact, Aaron, I checked the the, the line yesterday and. Uh, at least offshore, it was all six and a half. Now we're starting to see some more sevens kind of creep back into the uh, pitch, picture. So uh, interesting handicap. Again, tanking, Aaron, it, it, it's not. It's becoming more prevalent in sports. It's the right thing to do, but oftentimes, especially in the NFL, uh, talk of that usually doesn't occur until maybe week five, week six, uh, not before the uh, start of the regular season. So uh, also seen some movement on the over uh, total up to uh, 39 and a half. What's your uh, thought on the uh, the whole situation? Yeah, I mean, it's clear here what uh, Miami's doing. And, you know, I'll say this about the Dolphins. This is one of the least talented roster organizations to begin with uh, in the NFL. And this goes back uh, the last couple of years. Now, uh, you know, from the offseason until Sunday's game, you know, offensively, uh, they lose Juwan James, uh, Larry Tunsil. Uh, Kenny Stills, Amendola, Gore, defensively, Robert Quinn, Quinn, Cameron Wake, uh, Sue, I mean, Alonzo, it just on and on. There's just not much left here in Miami as they, they strip it down to the bones. And, you know, amazingly, this one, this team was seven and nine last year, eight and eight against the spread, seven and one in games decided by eight points or less. Now, you know, Brian Flores comes in as the head coach and, you know they're they're not tanking as far as they're they're on the field they're trying to lose with what they have they're still trying to win uh but yeah there's just no talent obviously Ryan Fitzpatrick going to be at the quarterback position Off- offensive line is really bad and you know it's just one of those things with Fitzpatrick i mean he's going to throw the ball downfield he's going to try to score um you know he's going to take chances and that obviously could work both ways in this game for Miami. So, um, you know, he can create some offense here, but he can give some offense back here uh, to Baltimore in this game. So, you know, it's not like it's going to be three yards in a uh, cloud of dust here for Miami with Fitzpatrick uh, under center. Baltimore, obviously a very intriguing team with what they're going to be able to do. Uh, Talking about this new offense, 30 30 to 40% uh, is new and all eyes will be on quarterback uh, Lamar Jackson is he, you know, approaches year two where they've essentially built this offense around him under Greg Roman. And, you know, I'll say this. We saw the, uh, them get shut down in the playoffs last year by San Diego. Uh, you know, I, I certainly think uh, this offense is going to work against the lesser teams, against the lesser defensive teams. And Miami certainly fits that bill. So uh, Baltimore should uh, be able to score some points and it, you know it's a tough team to prepare for uh, because you just don't know exactly uh, what they're going to bring uh, to the table here I mean John Harbaugh has essentially talked how uh, they are going to revolutionize how offense is played uh, at the NFL level so it's exciting it'll be interesting to see uh, what they are going to do and um, you know it, it's just a whole new ball game for what they're going to try to do uh, defensively it certainly is not although uh, it's going to be, you know, they lost a lot of talent uh, from a defensive perspective. L- Ladarius Smith, Brent Urban leaves, C.J. Mosley, Suggs is gone, Eric Weddle. I mean, that is the backbone and the glue uh, for this Baltimore uh, defense. Now, they've always done a great job of, of putting talent on this roster, and obviously they think they, they have the guys to uh, put in there and hold down the fort, but that's just a lot to replace, so... Uh, this offense certainly in the first week has a chance to move forward uh, defensively ranked third last year uh, it's just hard not to envision some sort of drop back and if that's the case here uh, boy you had a, such a low total earlier in the week I mean this one was 37 38 um, you just don't see those those low totals in the NFL anymore San Francisco at uh, Tampa Bay. You mentioned uh, Sam Darnold. I, I always kind of feel the same way about uh, Garoppolo. It's like, well, wait a minute, dude. This guy hasn't done anything uh, yet, and we know he struggled uh, with that infamous game during the preseason. Saved a little bit of face there in Week Three of the uh, preseason, but uh, never the uh, the less. A lot of people kind of point out statistically uh, thus far. 
Uh, he hasn't been all that great, although he has been uh, hurt. So we'll have to uh, wait and see. And I think as a result of that, Aaron, uh, the markets were perhaps kind of waiting for him to look the part during the preseason. He didn't. And as a result, you know, Tampa Bay, markets aren't high on uh, Tampa Bay. They want to bet San Francisco, but they're not here. As uh, Tampa Bay's kind of held firm. This one was a pick em, but uh, Tampa Bay actually going to be a favorite here, at least now. Uh, one, one and a half, 51. The uh, total, what are your thoughts? You know, to put it in a uh, a proper perspective, uh, Andrew, uh, Jimmy G, Jimmy Garoppolo, now 28 years old, he's had fewer pass attempts in the NFL than Baker Mayfield. <laughs> so, uh, and remember, Baker Mayfield didn't play until, what, week three or week four uh, last year. So uh, the jury is still definitely out. And I really thought that I was going to have a bet here on San Francisco, but I didn't get there. And, you know, this was a obviously a hot team, a hot commodity last year. And I think they still certainly can be that team this year. Remember last year, just a disaster. Minus 25 turnover ratio, uh, about as bad as it gets uh, from an NFL perspective. Last year, the defense for seven takeaways, seven takeaways from San Francisco's defense last year. Uh, I mean, a good defensive back comes up with more interceptions. Uh, than that, Andrew. So that's kind of crazy, but we'll see what Garoppolo is able to do. The you know kind of the problem I have uh, with San Francisco from a macro approach, if you will. Uh, at this point, I'm just not sold on John Lynch here as the general manager. Now they raved about some of these drafts a couple of years years ago, but it just has not panned out here uh, for the 49ers, and they have just not been able to upgrade the talent level on this roster to the degree that. Uh, they kind of thought so, or they talked about it. It's just not there uh, for this team. So the heat is on this organization. You know, they go out and, and make some big signings, obviously uh, D four from Kansas city, just the one, you know, just the one good year, 28 years old. Uh, they give him a, a ton of money. Um, uh, they, they, Nick Boza, they, they draft him as well. Quan Alexander, very bizarre signing coming off an ACL injury. Uh, for Tampa, they pay him fifty-four million dollars for four years. So when you haven't been able to produce the talent uh, from the draft, uh, now John Lynch has gotten a little bit desperate and signed some of these guys uh, from a offensive and defensive perspective, and it just leads me to kind of cause for concern, uh, as I mentioned. So we'll see a lot more here how they fare this week. Intrigued to see how this Tampa Bay. Uh, team's going to perform here under my old pal Bruce Arian, certainly a guy that uh, we've been able to make a lot of money with from the head coaching perspective. He's got his work cut out for him here uh, in Tampa Bay. I talked about how bad it was for San Francisco with 25 turnovers, about minus 18 turnovers uh, for Tampa Bay uh, last year, just nine interceptions, so it wasn't a whole lot better. They bring in Todd Bowles as the defensive coordinator. I think it's a positive uh, attacking blitz style. However, uh, they lose some talent. Uh, a guy like Gerald McCoy, as I mentioned, Quan Alexander, Brent Grimes. So um, <laughs> from a quarterback rating, it was uh, basically about the worst from a defensive uh, – what they allowed from a, a defense last year. Uh, they allowed uh, NFL quarterbacks 111 pass rating, 73% completion rate. Uh, you would think uh, this defense can only go up uh, from here. Uh, offensively, they should be fine. They are 12th rated last year. It's a little bit interesting. They bring in Arians to make the best and what they can do with James Winston. So uh, I'll be looking forward to watching this game on Sunday. But as of now, no bet for me. Next game, Kansas City and Jacksonville. And if you're wondering if serious betters, guys that are moving numbers, really care about preseason, because no one had a worse preseason statistically than uh, Jacksonville. They scored 29 points, Aaron, in uh, in four games. But despite all that, you got one of the sharpest uh, shops on the planet, uh, Chris, sitting Kansas City three with juice. Uh, Chiefs three and a half, uh, even money elsewhere. Uh, 51 and a half the uh, total. This is the uh, real season. What's going to take place there down in Jacksonville? Well, it's it's interesting. You know, it's a big year here for Jacksonville, and hopefully they upgraded the quarterback. And I think some of that, from an offensive standpoint, was you know it's just the they're really bad from a second and third string, four string quarterback. But they're hoping Nick Foles is the answer. Well, you know, I think from a leadership, from a chemistry standpoint, it's certainly going to be an upgrade upgrade over Bortles. Uh, we'll see if they can get any better. They try to bring in some some guys to. 
uh, help him. Uh, Conley, the wide receiver, remember Marquise Lee, uh, missed all of last year as well. Uh, from an injury standpoint, it, it was crazy. Last year, uh, they essentially missed 82 games um, You know, from an injury standpoint. That's just from the wide receiver, tight end, and offensive line standpoint. That's a crazy number, uh, let me tell you. So it was bad. It could only get better. Um, they bring in a new offensive coordinator, John D. Filippo, which is kind of interesting. He was fired, of course, uh, from Minnesota. Um, and, uh, you know, with that, you, you still have to remember, I mean, even last year, this team was ranked 30th from an offensive perspective, sixth from a defense. This defense still loaded, still a lot of talent, and they end up drafting a guy like Josh Allen. So uh, they should be fine. It's a great matchup uh, because you have this Jacksonville defense that's one of the better Uh, in the NFL, obviously matched up against this Kansas City offense. Uh, They can basically do no wrong. 50 touchdown passes last year for uh, Mahomes at the quarterback position, and that's really kind of a a lot of talk here in the preseason as we get into the season is, you know, it's just almost impossible for this Kansas City offense to be better, and you expect some regression at some point. But, you know, I, I think you could clearly make the the example where you you know you see these teams ascend one year on offense and they just can't duplicate that next year but Kansas City is kind of you know <laughs> there's just never been anything like it Mahomes is 23 years old he's not a 29 30 year old quarterback that just had a career year uh, you know the best is perhaps yet to come they don't really lose a whole lot offensively Andy Reid has talked about being more aggressive more big plays um, and you know he understands what he has now uh, from an offensive perspective, they get, you know they sign a guy like LaShawn McCoy uh, after he was let go uh, by Buffalo. So uh, they can get better. I mean, they can. Uh, we'll see if it can happen here. And again, it's just a great matchup against this Jacksonville defense with what they can do. Uh, the major question here is Kansas City, can they get better from a defensive uh, standpoint? They fire Bob Sutton. Uh, they bring in Steve Spagnuolo, who... You know, he, he hasn't had a ton of success here of late at the NFL level. Uh, I like the guys they brought in, like Frank Clark, Ty Mathow, although, uh, remember, they lose to Justin Houston, to D. Ford we mentioned earlier with San Francisco, uh, Nelson, the cornerback. So uh, how this uh, defense comes together, they're certainly going to be more aggressive uh, in blitz, but it remains to be a work in progress. So I think this is a close game. Uh, this is a great matchup. Looking forward to it. But uh, I'm going to take the underdog here with Jacksonville. Last game here, uh, Aaron, Tennessee and uh, Cleveland. I've been talking a little bit about the uh, line history. This line history has been great, and I, I love to see this in the uh, in the betting markets where if you go in, and I'm, I'm looking at Chris, and uh, Cleveland opened five, so it moved to five and a half. It went five and a half to six, back to five and a half to six, back to five and a half to six, and now, Aaron, it's back to five and a half. So really, you got two, uh, you know, uh, opinions working so you know given the uh, the trajectory here if you like Tennessee just wait because it'll probably eventually get back to a six in fact uh, I would imagine especially in Las Vegas you should be able to pick up plus six if that's the route uh, you are looking but for the time being Aaron uh, the Cleveland Browns uh, five and a half here offshore a uh, total of 45 and a half great matchup here what are your thoughts well, let's see if this uh, hype train that is the Cleveland Browns can deliver. They're going to be asked to, as you mentioned, favored by five and a half, six points, ten and six against the spread last year. Still just seven, eight and one uh, straight up. So, you know, this is their chance to kind of step forward. I'm interested uh, to see, um, you know, how much this defense moves forward with new defensive coordinator Steve Wilkes. Certainly a disaster of a head coach last year with Arizona, but I believe he's a very good coordinator. And I like uh, the fact that he takes over here from Greg Williams. I think it can be an upgraded defense. Uh, So much is talked about uh, Miles Garrett having uh, a chance to be just essentially a defensive MVP, loses 10 pounds. Uh, He thought he was perhaps limited uh, by Greg Williams uh, last year on this defense. They had Olivier uh, Vernon, uh, Burnett, uh, Sheldon Richardson. So, um, you know, everything, a lot of talk about, uh, Baker Mayfield in this offense and to a certain degree, that's great. Uh, but this defense, uh, has a chance to really lead this team here, uh, as well. And, you know, how Tennessee is going to contend with that. 
Um, you know, just a very interesting team. Obviously, a huge year for Marcus Mariota. Uh, new offensive coordinator Arthur Smith, more of a um, of a offensive line perspective of a running the football, if you will. He's never called plays before. Uh, and never been a uh, a coordinator here in the NFL uh, as well. So kind of interesting to see how it's all going to work out for this team. But we'll see if they can get better offensively. The blow here from a offensive line standpoint, and I just mentioned that front line here for Cleveland, uh, Taylor Luan, the uh, left tackle, he's going to be suspended here. Uh, for the first four games. So uh, that's the matchup I'm looking at here on this one Sunday. Uh, can this Tennessee offense show some improvement against what is for sure an improving Cleveland defense? And, you know, I made this game five, five and a half. I didn't have anything with the total. Uh, I'll be watching uh, and kind of figure it out and learn and, and move forward on this game. Hey, great stuff here from Aaron Rennie. Get all his plays for a week one or – uh, you get his uh, top-rated uh, best bet. In fact, that's going to be the uh, Sunday night uh, football game with uh, the Steelers and uh, Patriots. We'll talk about that game later in the show uh, with uh, Eric Waz, all of which available on the Buy Picks page. And don't don't forget the best route. If you like those two-unit uh, best bets, get all five here for week one of the NFL from the Better IQ uh, team for the discounted uh, rate. Uh, available clicks, links on the front page or the Buy Picks page if you have any questions. Uh, don't hesitate. Reach out to us, support at betteriq.com. We'll set up an account for you and get you squared away with the uh, service package of your choice, one that you feel uh, comfortable with. All right, let's uh, welcome in our next guest and wrap up this uh, week one card with Eric Waz. Waz, how are you this afternoon? Doing good, Andrew. Week one, finally here in the NFL. It's been a long time waiting. We've seen these lines out here for... Several months now, and uh, quite a bit of movement here in the market. So uh, it's very interesting, and I'm, I'm finally ready to see some actual game action. We saw a game last night with the, the Bears-Packers that was, was kind of ugly, but I'm looking forward to some more action this weekend and uh, I'm breaking down the games right now with you. We left off, uh, Waz, with Tennessee and Cleveland. Let's move down to uh, L.A. The Rams head to uh, Carolina, and this one way back in the summer opened uh, L.A. 3 Pinnacle two and a half, and it's down to as low as a one and a half, uh, two. I talked with Aaron. I talked with uh, you, uh, kind of off air, breaking down this uh, game, and uh, maybe uh, us three, or the trio, not necessarily agreeing here with this uh, anti Rams uh, movement. Uh, more importantly, you know, question is: Is Cam Newton can he hit the ground running here, heading into uh, the uh, regular uh, season? I know we got some uh, uh, issues, questions with that. So uh, that being said, here was. Uh, current market again showing one and a half offshore uh, total of uh, 50 give us your thoughts and opinions on this matchup yeah this one is a little bit of a head scratcher for me i mean I, I definitely agree with with just about all the moves that have been made in the market since they opened them you know back a few months ago everything's kind of moving in the direction that 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 i've leaned or have bet on and uh, this one definitely from a side perspective going uh getting pretty low here i'm a little surprised because cam newton obviously um he had the shoulder surgery in the off season um you know missed the last few games of last season hasn't played in a while uh, and then he plays in the preseason he gets banged up there with an ankle injury so he really didn't get hardly any snaps in preseason he's definitely going to be rusty in my opinion and the big thing to watch out for is he said he's had to change his throwing motion post-surgery so Anytime you kind of hear that with a quarterback, he's changing his throwing motion that he's been using his entire career. That's that's eye opening. I mean, you got to take note of that. Is he going to be the same guy he was uh, last year, the last few years? I don't know. I mean, maybe he will be, but uh, you know, I wouldn't want to be banking on that, especially in his first game back. Uh, we saw kind of what last night would happen when Trubisky and Aaron Rodgers play without really playing in the preseason. They looked really rusty. Um, Newton hasn't played since like week 14 of last year, so even longer. So I really think that he's going to struggle a little bit, uh, especially in the first half, kind of getting his feet wet and getting back in the in the rhythm. So, um, you know, the line coming down this low is a little surprising. I mean, the Rams obviously coming off the Super Bowl where they looked – um, really flat, and you know, a lot of, team, a lot of people like to fade the the Super Bowl teams here in Week One, and that's probably part of the reason we're seeing the move here. Uh, but I'm kind of interested in seeing this Rams team. I think it's going to be a little different team than they were last year. Just from reading what, what McVay's been saying, uh, he's saying a lot about uh, going two tight ends a lot. Uh, you know, utilizing Tyler Higby, Gerald Everett, who are both very capable of being weapons. They didn't really get utilized a whole lot last year. It sounds like McVay is going to go with more one-two personnel, which is two tight ends in the field. Um, he's talked about 
Todd Gurley, that he's still the center focal point of the offense. Um, you know, we know he's got the knee issue, so is he going to be the same back? Probably not going to carry it quite as much as he did last year, but they got a great, um, you know, secondary puncher. Daryl Henderson, they drafted in the third round from Memphis, who was fantastic in college. So um, it sounds like a little more running, you know, going short passing. You know, Cooper Cup is still. I'm reading reports on him that say he might not be 100% yet. He's your big deep threat down the field. And you know, remember last year, Andrew, the, the offense really dropped off when he was out. Um, so definitely keep an eye on him and see if he's out there uh, still running the deep routes, still looking like he was you know, last year when he was healthy. If he's not, I think this Rams offense is completely different. So um, I do think we'll see a, you know, a slower-paced offense with the Rams as well. And the defense really picked it up last season in the second half, um, especially late in the season, after week 12, after the bye week. They only uh, allowed 17.5 points per game in their last four contests. So looked a lot better. And obviously in the Super Bowl, the defense is what kept them in it. So um, I think this Rams team may, you know, may lean more on the defense this year. And that might be what carries them. Uh, Carolina on the defensive side, you, know, you got Ron Rivera, who's basically taken over the play calling. He's going to call the defensive signals. Um, he's done it before and, he, and it's kind of a specialty. So I think that'll be um, a positive thing for Carolina. They're moving to three, four more, get away from the four, three scheme they utilized. The last few years, uh, and they added some guys that really fit really well with that 3-4 scheme. They had Gerald McCoy, uh, I remember from Tampa Bay, who's going to be in the middle up front. Uh, Bruce Irvin, uh, they drafted a kid, Brian Burns, number 16 overall pick. So these guys really fit into what they believe in. They've kind of changed uh, with, with Rivera running the show now defensively, kind of changed their approach. So I think it'll be a positive for Carolina. The only big thing you know you got to worry about with, with the Panthers is that secondary. It was terrible last year at times. They got torched a ton. So they're really relying on this three four scheme to kind of change things, get more pressure up front. If they don't, it could be, you know, it could be bad news for Carolina. They definitely a lot a lot of big plays last year, but I think they'll get that under control here in, in twenty nineteen. So I, I I kinda expect a lower scoring game here, Andrew. I think you know, I think Carolina will come out slow. I think the Rams are gonna be a little different team. Um and I put as many points up this year. So I definitely lean towards the under and, and you know, and look at the move like I said before, the on the side. Um, you know, I thought that number at three was was about right. Now we're down to one, so I definitely lean towards the Rams at this number now. Detroit at uh, Arizona, and uh, this one opened a uh, pick 'em, and we saw immediate uh, Detroit uh, support. Uh, I would imagine a lot of that had to do with the markets saying the Kingsbury Murray, uh, you know, tenure probably going to take a little bit of a time, and the fact that this line really hasn't budged. In fact, it, it went up to three. Uh, was it was widely available at three, then get bet back to two and a half. So again, I think that's uh, better staying, uh, saying that it, hey, with Arizona, uh, this still isn't a very good team. Uh, you leave the door open, but at least for week one and the first maybe couple weeks, uh, it's going to be trying there for the uh, Cardinals. So uh, Detroit, uh, two and a half with a juice, uh, forty-five and a half, forty-six. The uh, total. Interesting uh, handicap. What do you got here, Waz? Yeah, well, both of these teams were absolutely terrible in preseason, but I, I wouldn't read a whole lot into that. I mean, you know, we had Kingsbury who, who's taken over and basically wanted to keep things very vanilla, didn't want to show the rest of the NFL kind of what he had in store for for the regular season. So he kind of played it close to the vest. Um, and then you had Detroit. I mean, Patricia's basically, uh, you know, uh, Bill Belichick uh, school of thought where hey, let's not, you know, show too much in preseason. These games don't matter. We'll keep it simple as well. So. I'm not surprised that, that they had a, you know, a couple of bad outings in the preseason. I wouldn't worry about that. I'm probably higher on the Lions than just about anybody. I really think you know this team could could you know could compete this year. I think they could be a decent team. That defense last year, in the second half of the season, was really amazing. They were a top five defense uh, those last eight games, which a lot of people don't don't remember. And um, it took them a while to kind of learn the new scheme of of Paul Pasqualoni. But once he got his guys you know running the scheme the right way, they looked really good. They went out and added Trey Flowers, which was one of the biggest additions in the offseason in the entire NFL. Um, he's a great playmaker. Uh, they need more pass rush. He'd definitely get it with him. Um, and then offensively, you know, you know, you see, you know, Patricia last year basically go to that ground and pound style, um, taking the ball out of Stafford's hands quite a bit, which is interesting because I think Stafford probably one of the more underrated passers in the league over the last five, six years. And he really had a terrible year. Um, he had some back issues, which are still kind of lingering. I keep reading that he's not quite right. Uh, he missed some time in the preseason. He had some issues with, with his wife and I had to miss some time for that as well. So, you know, it, it really, I don't know if he's the same quarterback he was in the past, 
So, you know, going to that more that, that ground game and leaning more on the running backs, they've got a great running back um, you know, duo back there. And carry on Johnson was fantastic last year, averaging five point four yards per carry. So I think they are gonna be more of a run team again in twenty nineteen. They actually, you know, to, to kind of solidify that. They brought an offensive coordinator, Daryl Bevel, uh, back from Seattle. And if you remember him, Andrew, back in his days with Marshawn Lynch, you know, Lynch would get the ball 30 times a game and, you know, run up the middle, run to the left, run to the right. I mean, it was a lot of just ground and pound style. And so he's going to definitely run the system that Patricia wants. So you'll see more of the same this year. I think you'll see him lean on that defense a little bit more. Uh, so, yeah, I think this, this, this Lions team, if Stafford ends up being – you know, back to his old form, which is a huge question mark. If he does get back to his old form, it's going to be a really dangerous offense as well. So I like this Lions team. Um, Arizona is kind of a, an interesting team for me. I, I feel like it's going to take them at least four or five games to really show us what they are. You can't expect, you know, this brand new offense installed by Kingsbury to be a well-oiled machine in week one. It's just not going to happen. Um, there's too many moving parts. There's a lot of motion in the offense, a lot of guys you know, running some some difficult routes. It's not your standard NFL offense. So you've got a rookie quarterback running in Kyler Murray. He's probably the perfect guy for this type of offense, but he's not going to pick it up immediately, you know, the way that Kingsbury wants to run it. So it'll take time, um, you know, and um, defensively, they got some talent in Arizona, but they've got a lot of injuries right now. You got Patrick Peterson, who's, who's suspended for the first six games of the season. These are by far the best player on the team. He not only hurts them defensively, but also hurts them on the return game. And then you got his uh, the opposite cornerback on the other side of the field, Robert Alford. He's out with a leg injury. So you got your top two corners out. Usually that's a really bad sign for a defense, especially a defense that doesn't have a whole lot of depth. So uh, they got Vance Joseph running the show defensively now from the from the Broncos after he got fired. Um, I think they will be a decent team at some point this season, Andrew. I don't think they're going to be terrible, uh, but they might be terrible the first few games, especially this first game. I think it's going to take them time. Uh, we saw these teams play last season in Arizona, same venue. I think the total on that game is about six points lower than what – the total on this game is right now, which is interesting. And that game ended 17 to three. So only 20 points scored. Um, we could see, I think, you know, maybe not quite that low scoring, but another low scoring game here. Uh, but I definitely think the Lions are the right side. Cincinnati had uh, Seattle. Uh, this one opened up Seattle seven and a half, now up to nine and a half. And really, that, that, that's not that big of a move, Waz. It's more of sports books maybe taking a couple of bets on Seattle and saying, all right, we got to bump it up just to protect ourselves from that uh, good old fashioned uh, two and a half point uh, or six point teaser down to uh, two and a half. So, uh, total 44 and a half. Again, Seahawks nine and a half, the number offshore. Uh, what's your take here? Yeah, this move is all about the A.J. Green injury. You know, he's he's such a big part of the offense, and um, they were terrible last year when he was out. So, you know, it, it's it's kind of terrible because you kind of thought that, you know, at least I thought that maybe the Cincinnati team, you know, could be a nice sleeper team that maybe gets some value from. They had a lot of injuries last year. I mean, they lost a ton of guys on offense, ton of guys on defense. And when they were healthy, they weren't that bad. They weren't healthy very often. But when they had, the, you know, when they had most of their guys back, they weren't a terrible team. And they have – Pretty much their same roster coming back. They have a new coaching staff here with Zach Taylor um, replacing Marvin Lewis, which which we'll talk about here in a second. But you know, when you have a, a, a team that brings back most of their guys and and you know is getting more healthy, I, I kind of like to back those teams. That was kind of the situation here um, for Cincinnati. But Zach Taylor replaces Marvin Lewis, like I said, uh, 36 years old, not really proven. Um, he was an offensive coordinator in Miami for like five games on an interim basis back a couple of years ago. Um, didn't didn't really go well. They averaged 17 points a game. He also called plays for one season at the University of Cincinnati in college. Uh, they're ranked 99th in offense, so not a very good run there either. Uh, he's gonna be calling the plays here for Cincinnati, so I'm not quite sure. You know, it's a little bit questionable hire. Um, he's got a lot to prove, obviously. And he brought in offensive line coach Jim Turner, who has a ton of controversy surrounding him. That was a curious hire. So the coaching staff for me is a little bit. Um, I don't know. It's it's a little bit strange the direction they went. Um, so we'll see if it works out. But you know, Andy Dalton, this is kind of his you know prove it year. If he doesn't do it this year, he's probably going to be in a backup quarterback the rest of his career, whether it's in Cincinnati or somewhere else. So the defense I kind of like though. I think the defense had a lot of injuries last year. They're they're looking healthier now. They got some talent. I think they'll be able to keep them in some games. Uh, but the offense here for the Bengals without AJ Green is definitely going to be challenging. Um, we switch over to Seattle here. Um, the number one rushing attack in the league last year. They're kind of bucking the trend here in the NFL. Uh, the NFL is turning into a big, you know, passing league now, and they're sort of going the other the other way. And there's some value in that, right? If everybody's zigging and you're zagging, 
Um, you know, a lot of a lot of these teams now are, are stacking the the defense with five or six defensive backs. If, if they're going to do that against Seattle, they're going to get they're going to get torched on the ground. So they definitely, you know, going different different route here. I think pays off in some regards. But you also have Russell Wilson as one of the you know a top ten quarterback. He can do a lot. You're kind of limiting you know what he can do when you're running so much. So I think we'll see more of the same that we saw last year. Chris Carson, the running back, Rashad Penny, good one two punch. Um, the one thing they're one thing they're really going to miss now on this team is the deep ball. Um, Doug Baldwin retired. He's a huge part of the offense the last few years. One of the best, probably most one of the most underrated uh, pass catchers in the league. Uh, great hands, and just missing him, I think it's gonna I think it's gonna expose them deep. I think the teams are gonna be able to, you know, stack more in the box now. And you got Tyler Lockett, they're kind of relying on to be the deep guy now. He's not the same player as Doug Baldwin here. So it's a different team. Uh, they do, do have all five starters back on the offensive line, which is a huge bonus early on in the season. Um, the defense here for Seattle, very solid here as far as the, the linebacker core up front. They're OK. Um, some question marks here in the secondary for Seattle. So I kind of want to see how that plays out. Uh, and they had a the league best plus 15 turnover ratio last season. We de- definitely see uh, Tennessee regression there when teams are you know, that fortunate um, from a turnover standpoint. So, I, you know, the Seattle team, I think a lot of people last year were kind of expecting them to take a step back. They really didn't, um, you know, got into the postseason. They were a solid team. Uh, this year might be the year they take the step back, though. I really think there's some holes there. I really think that, that relying so much on the ground might be kind of detrimental to at some extent. So we'll see. Um, you know, I don't have an opinion as far as where the, the lines are right now. I think it's about right. Uh, the total might be a tad bit high, just, just you know, given where Cincinnati is without A.J. Green. But uh, I'll probably just sit back and watch this one, Andrew. Yeah, Waz, well, if anything, Seattle, unlike last season, now they come into this season with at least modest expectations. That wasn't the case last season. Yeah, you're right. I mean, a lot of people were. It's just the zigzag approach, perhaps. Yeah, no, you're right. You got to kind of, sometimes you got to move against what the market thinks, what the public thinks. And uh, yeah, the Cincinnati or the Seattle team, I mean, you know, for years under Carroll, I mean, you know, you. You can count on them for being a 10 win, 11 win team and, you know, being the playoff hunt. They got, you know, they got to some Super Bowls. I mean, they're, they're a great team, but it's, you know, it's just not, uh, unless they start changing the game plan a little bit, I don't think we're going to see that anymore. Colts said uh, Chargers, of course, uh, Andrew Luck are retiring. In fact, we dedicated an entire Better IQ uh, segment to uh, what took place and, more importantly, what's taking place in the uh, betting uh, markets. And uh, you and I have had uh, lengthy discussions. We did have a lengthy discussion. And kind of my take was was this current line of Chargers minus six and a half, total of forty four and a half. To me, feels like it's in a pretty good spot. But I, I feel as if you know the performance by Brissett, if it's really really good, really really bad, I'm kind of hoping for that outlier uh, because that's when I think you'll see the markets really potentially overreact uh, to the uh, the situation. But uh, a lot of unknowns here, although Brissett. Uh, as you talked about on the, the last segment, Waz, has had uh, plenty of opportunity, plenty of uh, playing time. So we at least have something to go with. So uh, as mentioned, Chargers 6.5, total of 44.5. What's your opinion? Yeah, I talked about it before. I'm not a big Brissette guy. I mean, look at his career numbers. They basically slot in around you know, 35th best the last season. If you, you compare his QBR, his quarterback rating, uh, you know, he's a slightly ahead of what Josh Rosen was last year, which was a disaster. So... I don't see all the love for Brissett. I mean, I know he's in a great situation. That's probably why people are a little bit higher on him. He's got a great offensive line, definitely one of the best in the league. All five starters back. They're young. They're agile. They're yeah. You know, they're great lines. A great line to be behind. And he's got great weapons. You got T. Y. Hilton. Um, they drafted Paris Campbell, who looks really good so far. Eric Ebron, Jack Doyle, as far as the tight end group. So he's got you know he's got a great team around him. He's got a great backfield. Marlon Mack. So it's a good offense. Um, it's still going to be a good offense. It's not going to be as good as it was under Andrew Luck. There's no way, I mean, especially when you look at downfield passing, big plays. You're not going to see nearly as many with Brissett. Uh, Brissett can do a little bit more running. He's a little bit, you know, better with his legs and create some plays. You might see some plays in the run that are, you know, kind of nifty here and there. But again, I mean, going from Andrew Luck to Jacoby Brissett is going to be a huge drop off from a passing standpoint. We can't, you know underestimate that so um but i like this colts organization you got the right management team you got a great head coach in frank reich i think they'll figure it out um but this kind of got you know you know pushed them at the last minute here so i don't think they you know went into the summer into the camp you know thinking this was their guy so the whole offense is kind of getting um 
you know, tweaked right now, and, and maybe even bigger than that might be, you know, totally redesigned around for such strengths. I don't know. They haven't really said much about that. I've been waiting to see if I hear anything, and they're pretty hush about it. So um, the defense, though, was great last year. They're, they're I think, 10th over in DVOA, which people probably wouldn't have guessed. Uh, the defense might need to carry them at times this year with if the percent doesn't, you know, play up to par. They'll need that defense. I think they can rely on it. I think it's going to be another top 10 ish defense, so it'll keep them in games. Um, you know, flipping over here to the Chargers, um, you know, people still think the Chargers are a top five ish team in the NFL. Um, you know, they could be again. They've got most of the team back. I'm a little concerned about a couple of the injuries they have right now, though, Andrew, especially in the offensive line with Russell Okung is out. Um, he's definitely their best offensive lineman. He's a left tackle, which is one of the key spots, obviously. That line was already the weakness of the team. Um, you know, they probably have a bottom seven or eight line in the entire NFL. And, you know, when you have a good a team as good as theirs, um, you know, that that's a big weakness to be up a uh, weak offensive line. So uh, having him not be there week one is, is huge. And I think that could cause some problems offensively. On the defensive side of the ball, Derwin James is definitely one of their best defenders. He's actually one of the best defenders probably in the NFL at this point. Um, a sensational rookie season. People are expecting him to get even better this year. They utilize the secondary uh, very heavily, you know, with five or six defensive backs a lot uh, with the Chargers. They definitely um, you know, play the nickel and dime game a lot more. So not having Derwin James back there might even change your scheme a little bit because he was so big and covered so much territory back there that you can get away with some things and they're not going to be able to do that as frequently this year. So, you know, watch for that as well. So, you know, those are big injuries. Um, You have no Melvin Gordon there as well, which isn't a huge loss because um, Austin Eckler was, was really good last year. He averaged 5.2 yards per carry on 106 carries, a very capable backup. But then you worry about, okay, who's going to back him up now? Because Eckler's not going to get 25 carries a game. He's more like a 15 carries a game guy at the most. So you're going to still need somebody to come in. So it does hurt them having Gordon out. So they're not, you know, they're not quite the same team when you consider who's missing uh, right now for the Chargers. So, I, you know, I understand the money coming in on Indianapolis here a little bit um, with, with the injury situation for the Chargers. Um, not really on board with the, the Joe, Jacoby Brissett love, but I'm definitely going to sit back and watch this one and kind of see uh, what Brissett looks like. And like you said, Andrew, look for an opportunity to see if maybe we get a better number next week based on a little bit of overreaction from his performance. Giants, uh, Cowboys, talk with Aaron earlier. This is another uh, divisional affair here going in uh, week one. And uh, recently, uh, what, over the course of the last, uh, what, 12, 15 hours, seen some support here, Waz, uh, for the uh, Giants. Is, uh, it was seven and a half prevailing there. Uh, earlier uh, today. Now we're seeing seven uh, tacked to the uh, Cowboys with a little bit of a juice. There's still some seven halves out there, but seven minus 115, Chris, Buckeye, uh, Jazz. Uh, Pinnacle has seven and a half minus 02, almost the, uh, the same thing. So a uh, total of 45 and a half. Uh, Eli Manning, what do you got here, Waz? Yeah, Eli Manning, I mean, uh, you know, I understand the decision a little bit because, you know, they're trying to make the case they want to win and they're going to try to, you know, be a postseason caliber team this year, which we know is probably not going to happen. Um, and if you're going to go with the rookie quarterback out of the gate, you're kind of basically saying we're, we're sort of maybe giving up or just going to play the long game here. But, but, you know, I'm a little surprised this line's not a tad higher. I mean, I, I think it could justify it being eight, eight and a half. Um, you know, we've got a giants team that they lost with El Beckham, you know, one of the most dynamic players in the game. It's going to change their entire offense. So teams are going to be able to key in on, Saquon Barkley now, and they couldn't do that last year when you have Beckham out there, right? Beckham gets a lot of attention. He opens up the field. He can't put as many guys in the box uh, when he's on the field. Now Barkley's are only really weapon offensively, especially when you consider that a lot of the receivers are banged up right now. They had Golden Tate suspended. Corey Coleman's off for the season. Um, Sterling Shepard's banged up. He's probably going to play, but he's not 100%, it looks like. So, you know, Barkley is going to get a ton of carries, a ton of catches. He's probably going to touch the ball 30, 35 times a game. But when teams know it's coming, it's not going to be nearly as effective as it was last season. So I really think this Beckham injury, or sorry, this Beckham uh, trade is a lot bigger deal than, I mean, people are making a big deal about it, but I think it's a huge deal. I mean, I think it's going to change everything for the Giants. So I really think this offense is going to go south. And the defense, you know, is a huge concern as well because they shook up the whole defensive line. Um, the secondary has three new player, three new starters in it. Um, they really kind of just decided to blow it up and kind of start over with with their with their system defensively. Um, 
and I don't, you know, that that might be good in the long run, but uh, it's definitely going to hurt them here early on in the season. So I don't think their their defense is going to keep them in games those first few weeks. For the Cowboys, it's the exact opposite. I mean, they have basically the same roster they had from last year. They returned 21 of 22 starters. A lot of continuity. The chemistry should be great out of the gates. They get Zeke Elliott back just in time for the season. Um, you know, he's the kind of guy, he probably doesn't need much preseason prep, so he'll be fresh, he'll be ready to go. Um, you know, the offense will be interesting to watch this year for the Cowboys. You know, you got the new offensive coordinator, Kellen Moore. Uh, by all accounts, a very bright mind, a younger guy. He thinks, you know, more along the lines of innovation, a lot of motion, spreading things out, more deep balls, keeping defenses on their toes, which is the exact opposite of what Jason Garrett and all the coordinators before were, where they were very conservative, predictable. So I think that's going to be really good uh, for the Cowboys. I mean, they have that great offensive line. They got the great running game. Let's give Prescott a chance to use more of his skills and open up the field more. They were great last year when Amari Cooper, Amari Cooper came over in the trade. Um, they, they, they threw down field more. Uh, they opened things up. I think we're going to see a lot more of that now with Kellen Moore. Uh, you're going to see also Prescott maybe making some plays with his legs a little bit more. That's something that they didn't really do a lot with in the past. So I think this Cowboys offense has the potential to be a you know top five or six offense if things all kind of click with with Kellen Moore here. So uh, keep an eye on that. And then the defense, you know, you know they were a top ten defense last year uh, with Rod Marinelli. He's back. Uh, you know, not a whole lot of change there either. They have the base of the same defense back. They got a couple of guys banged up right now, but not a huge deal. Uh, they got Randy Gregory, the defensive end. He's suspended for the first few games. Um, he'll be out. But, I mean, you know, it's a good, solid defense. It's going to keep them in game. So I really like this Cowboys team, and I like them more at the beginning of the season because of that continuity, that chemistry being back. So I think they might, they might outperform uh, early on in the season. And, I, you know, I think this is a good spot here against the Giants, who you know, are kind of a disaster and a ton of turnover. And, you know, you lose Odell Beckham. You lose a lot of guys on defense. Um, I think it might take them – quite a while to figure things out if they ever figure things out and then you might see daniel jones in there you know five six weeks into the season so um i think good spot here for dallas sunday night football pittsburgh in new england uh we talked about it during our uh preseason analysis uh going back uh, earlier this uh, summer new england notorious for uh sluggish starts at least from a betting perspective to uh, start the uh, season this one in fact open six uh, five and a half now prevailing uh, offshore. Uh, total play down was. Do you agree with it? Fifty-one and a half down to forty-nine. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I definitely agree with it. Everything you read about the Patriots over the last few weeks is they're focusing more on the ground game. Um, maybe don't have quite as many weapons to throw to with with Gronk out. Um, you know, him being retired is going to change the offense a little bit. Um, Nikhil Harry, their first round pick, who is going to be. The deep guy that's going to stretch the field, he's out now. He's going to miss the, the first part of the season. So they do have Josh Gordon, but, you know, you say, is he going to be, you know, in game shape and ready? He wasn't even sure he's going to be, you know, able to play week one. So I'm not sure how much they'll be able to work him in uh, early on. So I definitely think we'll see, you know, more of the ground game, more of the short passing game that we've seen in the past with Edelman and, and, the, and the, the running backs coming out of the backfield. Um, and I think, you know, defensively, I think this is probably – one of the best defense Bill Belichick has had with the Patriots. Um, there's not too many weaknesses. They have definitely one of the best secondaries in the NFL, a very deep secondary. And Patrick Trump is going through some legal troubles right now with the drug possession. So we'll see. I'm, I'm not sure he's going to be around anytime soon, but um, you know, it doesn't really matter. I think because they have a very deep secondary. They brought in Michael Bennett from Philadelphia to kind of fill the hole of, of Trey flowers, leaving kind of a wash there. Um, they have a great set of linebackers here in New England. So it's, it's kind of odd because usually going into the season with New England, the concern usually on paper at least is the defense. And what happens is they struggle early on uh, for the first, you know, four, five, six weeks. Bill Belichick starts making adjustments, watching film of other teams, you know, tweaking the defense here and there and, and finally gets it right by the end of the season going into the playoffs. I think they might have it figured out, you know, the first couple weeks of the season. So, you know, it's kind of scary to think how good they could be. Uh, by the end of it. So we'll see. Um, but I, I definitely agree with the total coming down here because Pittsburgh, you know, I think in the same boat, I mean, there's not a lot to say. They're, they're basically, you know, minus Antonio Brown, I think, you know, very predictable as far as how, how they're going to succeed this year versus last year. The defense isn't that much different. Uh, Keith Butler's back, the defensive coordinator who – it's a guy I'm not a huge believer in, but, you know, he made some terrible decisions in certain games last year. Uh, people thought he might get canned, but he's back. But he has, you know, he has 
a great defensive line, you know, great group of linebackers. Um, you know, the secondary has some talent. So, you know, it's a solid unit. I don't think we'll see a lot of drop off offensively without Antonio Brown. I mean, uh, you know, Smith Schuster, Juju, I mean, he's great. I think he'll fill in nicely. Uh, James Washington looked really good in the preseason. So I think his offense will be about the same as they were last year, maybe a, a tiny drop off. But um, no, I think the, the move here makes sense. I don't have a big opinion on the, on the side. I think that number is about right, although we have seen in years past New England get off to slow starts uh, in week one, week two, week three. So I, you know, I definitely could get on board with that move a little bit, but uh, I don't really like fight, fading the Patriots too often, so I stayed away from that one, Andrew. Monday night, a doubleheader, the first of which is going to be Houston in New Orleans, and uh, this was a big Twitter play. Houston, you always got to be careful of those uh, Twitter plays, but uh, the market is agreeing with Twitter. That, that's two very powerful entities there, uh, Laz, <laughs> but uh, you had uh, New Orleans open 7.5, uh, now down to 6.5 at a number of offshore uh, sports books, and uh, like I said, uh, New Orleans has a little bit of a pedigree for uh, perhaps some sluggish starts to the uh, season. Uh, total play down a little bit, 54 down to uh, 52. Uh, give us your take here on this uh, Monday night uh, matchup. Yeah, I mean, I kind of agree with with Twitter and the market too a little bit here. I mean, I think it's the right side. I think you know you look at a couple of factors. You know, one being the Saints get off to really slow starts historically under Sean Payton, Drew Brees as well doesn't. He doesn't play much in preseason. He seems like he needs a game or two to kind of get the juices flowing. So I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I know it's a pretty strong uh, anti-week one play for the Saints historically. So that's probably part of the reason why you're seeing the move. Um, also, Houston made that big trade to get Tunsil in to kind of beef up the offensive line. That was their biggest weakness um, last season with the offensive line. You saw with Deshaun Watson just take a beating back there. Um, 162 hits, 62 sacks. He had cracked ribs. He had bruised lungs. He had a damaged sternum. Didn't miss a snap. The guy was fantastic. So um, great season by by Watson, but he can't go through that that level of pain again. His body won't be able to take it. So they had to do something. They really didn't do much until <laughs> until last week, until that trade. I mean, the offensive line, they drafted a kid that we're not sure is Titus Howard, a left tackle. He, you know, first rounder, but he's from Alabama State, which, you know, not great competition. So you wonder if he can fit in. Uh, made a couple other moves, but really, you look at the, the the level of talent on the offensive line now versus a year from now, not all that much better. But then they go out last. We can get we get Tunsil from Miami, the the left tackle. He's a great lineman. He's going to change things for sure. Um, you know, that's a it's a huge move. Um, it might take the line a little bit to get that chemistry built up with all the the turnover. You know, you get in the off season. Um, you know, offensive lines usually. Yeah, they 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 work off of cohesiveness. All five guys move in the same direction. Um, you're not going to get that right away here with Houston. Um, but you know, the great defense for Houston. They were able to you know get rid of Clowney because they had so much depth in the front seven. I mean, um, you know, they they had a kind of an embarrassment of riches there. So I think them trading Clowney uh, to get a strong offensive lineman was really a good move because they traded from a position of strength into a position of weakness. Um, you got JJ Watt back. You got a real deep linebacking core. Uh, the secondary is a little bit suspect here. It might take some time to get them going as well. They lost a couple of key guys. Uh, Tyron Matthew, Kareem Jackson uh, are both gone now. So, I, you know, I, I think overall it might take this Houston team a little bit of time to hit their full stride. New Orleans, um, like I said, has struggled in the past. And, you know, remember last year in week one against Tampa Bay, they got kind of, um, blasted at home didn't look very good at all um but they've got basically the same team back the one big addition on offense was jared cook the tight end um they really were kind of missing that element last year like a, a nice guy down the middle down the seam they can go deep and he could definitely do that so it's a nice addition they got from the raiders um but well you know we know what the colts are or, sorry what the saints are going to bring um you know that you know you got your breeze back there he's been great you know he's aging um, a great receiving core with Thomas back there, you got Kamara catching the ball. They did lose Ingram, uh, the, the the secondary back, um, which I don't think is a huge loss. I think you'll see Kamara getting more more carries and more catches, which is probably um, a plus overall. So we know we're getting with the Saints offense. I think we know what we're getting with the defense as well. The defense hasn't changed much from last year either. Uh, really solid unit. It's not great, but it keeps them in games. Big question mark for the defense was the secondary. We'll see how they perform this season. They got a lot of younger guys on rookie deals still. So if there's one weakness for the Saints and where they're going to get hurt, I think it's going to be, you know, back in the secondary. So um, Houston obviously has the receivers to kind of take advantage of that. So I think it could be some mismatches back there. 
Uh, but like I said, I you know I think the big thing here for me is you know one thing I haven't mentioned yet. Home field advantage is another thing that uh, early on in the season, home field advantage is generally about a half point or so worse uh, than it is you know comparing it to like December, for instance. So the Saints are a great example of a team with a big home field advantage. In week one, you don't really have that advantage. Now, there's no travel advantage. Everybody's starting a, a, a blank slate, you know. So um, that may be, might be part of the reason of the move. And also, like I said before, the Saints struggling early on in the season under Peyton is probably another reason why we're seeing this move here, Andrew. Last game, it's a doozy was Denver in Oakland. Oakland opened three back in the summer, but we've seen uh, nothing but Denver money, no doubt correlated to all the uh, well-documented uh, dysfunction. Waz, you seem like the type of guy that likes to be challenged on occasions. Why don't you uh, spend all the time, uh, all your analysis, giving reasons as to why uh, we should bet the uh, Oakland Raiders again, catching one at home, total, <laughs> total of 43. Bring us home here, Waz. Oh, man, There's, it's tough to come up with reasons to bet the Raiders. I'm a very big believer, and a lot of people you know, argue against this, especially the modelers out there that, you know, team chemistry, emotion, you know, these softer factors aren't really part of the handicap. And I couldn't really disagree with, with that uh, thesis, thesis more. I think there's really a lot to be said for teams that get along, teams that, you know, have a lot of positivity, um, you know, teams that work hard. And you watch the Hard Knock show uh, on HBO, the Raiders. You see a lot of dysfunction there. You see a lot of misfits. You see the Antonio Brown saga unfolding. Um, it's really hard, I think, to stay motivated when you've got, you know, this guy, you know, basically say, I'm not playing games. I don't have the right helmet. I, you know, I, my feet are frozen. I, you know, I, all these different excuses. And then he, you know, finally, you know, rips the GM uh, Mayock and says basically that he's a clown and, you know, gets suspended for a day. Then they reinstate him. I mean, it's all this chaos before we even start the season. I can't even imagine once we get into the season, there's some, you know, the losses start piling up, how bad it's going to get here for, for Oakland. So I, I don't like backing teams like that. So I really, for me, I mean, they're, they're every week, they're going to be either a fade or a pass. Uh, but I kind of like Denver this week. I like their team a lot. Um, you know, I'm very high on them. I think bringing in Vic Fangio was a good move, especially given how good their defense is already. I think he'll be able to take that over, really make his mark with a lot of talented guys. Their their defense, in a lot of ways, has some similarities to the Bears' defense. Um, you know, not quite as good, but they have a lot of talent there. And I think Fangio can bring them um, a couple notches higher. Um, the big question mark for the Broncos is is Joe Flacco. Um, you know, it looked like his career was over, you know, last year, and maybe even the year before that. He had a couple of bad seasons in a row. Um, he's getting older. His arm strength is not as good as it was a few years back. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think he's the right guy. Um, if he can just be league average, I think this could be a good team. Um, you know, they'd probably, in my opinion, be like a nine win team if they had a, just a, an average quarterback, maybe even, a, maybe even better than that. Um, yeah, because if they have a nice backfield, Lindsey and Freeman, the rookies last year were both fantastic. They're back for their second year. You got Emmanuel Sanders back, um, you know, a decent offensive line. They brought in Mike Munchak, the offensive line coach. He is by far, you know, one of the, the best in the business. So I think, you know, not, it's not very often you're talking about offensive line coaches, but, He's he's great. He'll make this offensive line a lot better, and it won't take him very long. He's got a great history of doing that. Um, so expect them to have even a better running game and Flacco have more time to throw than maybe he's used to. And that you know, I, this potential is here. I mean, I wish they had. Like I said, I wish they had you know a decent quarterback because this would be a nice surprise team. I think they're gonna you know probably lose some games they shouldn't because of poor play by by Flacco. But uh, if he could just be you know be okay, not turn it over, and kind of manage the game. Um, this could be a good Broncos team, and I, and I like them in this opening week spot. You know, a brand new head coach in Fangio. Um, I think last year that if the first week of the season, those new head coaches were undefeated. I want to say it was maybe five and zero or six and zero against the spread. I think we'll see. You know, uh, that trend continue, and uh, you know, Fangio's first week here, I think he'll be ready to go. I think he'll be fired up. And you got a team in the Raiders. I don't know what they are right now. I don't know if they're fired up. I don't know if they're disappointed. I don't know if they're confused. Um, lots of reasons here. I don't know if they're going to get to the game on time, Waz. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you watch Hard Knocks, and it seemed like chaos everywhere. And, you know, there's so many head-scratching moves the Raiders made. I mean, even, you know, the biggest one, I think, on the offensive line, we talk about offensive line coach for Denver being one of the best, and Mike Munchak. You got Tom Cable, uh, still the offensive <laughs> line coach. I mean, he's he's been terrible. He's like, I think he's been, like, the bottom five or six offensive lines everywhere he's been for his entire career. He's, like, 13 years in. 
and it, he always makes the line worse wherever he comes. So, you know, they brought him in uh, last year and they were terrible. He's still here. Um, the defense is a mess. I mean, you know, I just, you know, there's not much else to say. It's going to be, it's going to be another long year in Oakland. I, I kind of don't want this team to come to Vegas, Andrew. I mean, I wish they we could bring another team here because uh, it's definitely not getting any better. They kind of ripped up the whole roster. You know, last year was their year one under Gruden. You see a lot of teams struggle the first year of a new head coach um, to kind of get the systems implemented, get the right personnel in there. And then year two, you know, things tend to get a lot better. This is kind of like year one all over again because they, they, they made so many moves defensively and offensively um, to try to get the right guys that Gruden won. So this is basically year one all over again, and, and it's not going to be pretty. It's just not. Great stuff with Eric Waz. He's got five plays going for a week of one. You can get all five on the uh, Buy Picks page at Better IQ. You can also get his uh, best bet. In fact, you can get all five best bets from the Better IQ handicappers for NFL's uh, week one at a discounted uh, rate. Every option, both college and pro, uh, you're good to go. All on that Buy Picks page. Check that out. If you do have any questions, as always, don't hesitate. Reach out to us, support at betteriq.com. Uh, we'll help you out and, again, uh, get you squared away and get you uh, rolling here with some early season uh, profits in both college and uh, the NFL. All right, that's going to wrap up the uh, show. Thanks for uh, listening, and uh, podcast will be back again on Monday. <laughs>